Welcome to Face the Jury. I am really excited about the special guest we have on the show today. I can say without reservation that our guest today has had more impact on my trial practice than any other person on this planet, by a long shot. Uh, our guest today wrote the book on essential trial skills for plaintiff's lawyers called Ball on Damages. I think it's called Ball on Damages 3 now. Uh, he later co-produced the litigation uh, strategy and approach dubbed the Reptile Revolution uh, that still terrifies defense lawyers uh, as we see motions in limine trying to exclude it every, every time we have a trial. Uh, but at the core of his work is helping lawyers help their clients, and I'm very pleased today to welcome David Ball to the podcast. Welcome, David. Well, thank you for having me, and how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It is such an honor to talk with you. Um, and I, I, I remember a lawyer friend of mine telling me, or introducing somebody and saying, well, he doesn't need any introduction. You know, he needs no introduction. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction, a little more of an introduction, because Every lawyer listening to this podcast will know who you are, but we, uh, we're more public-facing and invite the general public to listen to try and understand medical malpractice and be, um, protect their families from the risk of medical malpractice. I want to go a little bit deeper and talk about you at the risk of embarrassing you, um, but I've done my research and I know a little bit, uh, a lot about your background, actually, how you are a, uh, an early engineer, uh, early pre-med. Uh, we, we have that in common. We both got stymied in the uh, in biology lab, <laughs> which I could not stand the lab work. And uh, I liked the work. I just didn't like the smell. The smell. You know, I still remember the chemical reaction in organic chemistry that told me I should not be doing lab work as I'm blowing yes. things up. The uh, chemical reaction in the lab table in front of you and in your stomach. And exactly. <laughs> Both of them. But your journey is interesting because you, you gravitated towards theater mm -hmm. uh, and, and really made an impact in theater. And then later in life, I should say you made an impact and you made an impact on so many uh, future performers and uh, theater people. Um, and then later in life, you got involved in trial practice. And share with us your journey your and the, the best way to ask it is tell us your story it's fascinating <clears throat> well it's sort of a story of a person who was very good at telling other people how to do things that he couldn't do very well uh, i'm a terrible actor for example but i trained and did a good job of it i trained actors for years um i had been doing theater for many many years i got to my late 40s i guess and i had a a really lucky career. I mean, I was teaching at probably, if not the best, one of the two best training conservatories in the country. Uh, the students were going out and all becoming people who were either known or at least working all the time in the field. Um, pretty much doing what I, I, I really wanted to do there, but uh, I got uh, I got burnt out, I guess. Uh, I just never want to, I, I was directing two, three, four shows every year, and I finally woke up one morning and I said, if one more actor walks in front of me and acts, I'm going to shoot him. I just got tired of, of it. I really got tired of it. And um, I didn't want to do that anymore. So since I'd had a science background early on, and background in in weird little things like small group decision making and stuff uh, just a smattering of things mm -hmm. uh, a lot in, in science and technology uh, spent in engineering school um, I wasn't where a lot of theater folks are when they get to that same point of just being tired of it uh, there were a lot of other options <clears throat> but I wasn't looking for an option I, I, I uh, didn't really need a job at the time so I went off to the woods to write uh, the great American novel, uh, which I did. It's sitting in my desk drawer right there, if anybody ever. Uh, and I realized one of the reasons I'd been in theater is because theater provides not just your artistic and income work, but it's also your family. It's practically your religion. It's, it's your community, and it's... It's a populous community. There's a lot of people around that you're working with all the time. 
And here I am off in the woods pretending to be Emory Ralph Waldo Emerson or something, or <clears throat> Thoreau or one of those people very happily working away alone. And I, I just got up. I needed to be around people. So uh, it, it you can't hang around the supermarket but for so long. Um, and there, <laughs> so I just started hanging around courthouses, which I'd always been vaguely interested in. Uh, and I just, I would write much of the night, and then in the morning I'd go down to the Durham County in North Carolina courthouse to see, uh, watch a trial. <clears throat> and my first reaction was, it is astonishing how boring this stuff is. You walk into a courtroom, this is still true, unfortunately, today with an awful lot of lawyers, and I'm afraid the number is increasing, and I'll explain that in a little while if you mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, allergies. I thought, how can a thing that's built on the same structure as theater and movies be so amazingly boring. You walk into a courtroom, if there's a jury there, and you look at the jury, and you have to watch them for a while to figure out if they're alive, because they're sitting there looking not just asleep, but dead, or wishing they were. <laughs> and yet, it's a trial, and at the heart of a trial is conflict which is the heart of every play. And in fact, as I'm doing my research back then, the origin of plays comes from the same human beings, the same individuals who developed the first trials. They were the same individuals, not the same nationality, the same era, the same individual people, often in the same buildings or same sort of buildings. How did this happen? So I, I just had a curiosity, I started watching it, and I, I, my main interest at first was how the heck can you just get jurors to listen to you? Mm -hmm. Which was not that hard a problem. Um, so I wrote a little article about it somewhere, and somebody called me and said, hey, can you come help out on this next trial? And I said, no. I don't know one thing about it other than watching a year or two of trials, because I'd watched for a long time while I was writing that great American novel that's in that drawer. <clears throat> and I did get interested in it, though. At first, from a just an audience point of view, of how do we get these people interested? How do we get them thinking what, whatever side I might be on wants, wants them to think? How do we make things clear to them? How do we bring them back so they become as important in a trial as an audience is in a play? Uh, you can walk into a theater and, and quickly identify uh, a play where the director and actors, the last thing on their minds was the audience. Oh, they're just doing their art, you know. And so the audience stopped being very interested in them, which is still the major problem with theater. Uh, rather than the other way around, the only reason we're doing this is because there's an audience here. And the only reason you're doing a trial is for the audience, your fact finder, uh, to perceive things the way you want them to perceive them, bearing in mind that we are not just logical but also emotional and bias-driven creatures. And that evolved into a, a really paying a lot of attention to strategy rather than just the jury, because paying attention to the jury means strategy. <clears throat> and then just sort of expanding outward from, from there, but always the name of the firm that I started, my little one-person firm at the time, now two, all these 30 years later, is Jury Watch, to emphasize the focus we're having on jurors. As I said, I was not looking for a damn career. I didn't want a career. I didn't want to do theater anymore except continue writing for it. Um, but I kept thinking back to my, uh, my professional career started a theater in Minneapolis called The Guthrie, which at the time was sort of the major theater of the Western Hemisphere, <clears throat> where I didn't belong at. <clears throat> I did not when I started there. I, th I hope by the end I did. I started there on a, on a fellowship. But keep going back. I kept going back there as the standard, where the skills were so exquisitely honed and where things could be learned and where one's natural gifts were expanded on instead of just relied on and that's all there is. 
And then one morning I woke up and said, how come nobody knows how to talk about damages to juries, including some of the best lawyers I was watching? This is now a couple of years in. And I was asked to do a seminar on damages. And to best prepare, because I wasn't doing that many seminars in those days, nobody heard of me who was asking me to do seminars, uh, I looked around for, are there any books on this or any articles, is anybody teaching anything? And there was almost nothing. The only stuff that was out there was teaching the law of damages, not the strategy of damages. And in fact, there was damn little on strategy at all. There was jury work from the National Jury Project, and there was Eric Oliver, one of the early geniuses in the field, but very little, and publishers paying very little attention to getting the, the, the work of those people out there. Um, and most of the stuff that was out there was about the law or procedure or you know, necessary stuff like that, but there was not much on strategy. And I thought, I'm gonna, this is after I'd written the book on theater tips and strategies for jury trials, I, 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 I'm gonna fill a niche that nobody's done. And I said, let's write a book, I'm gonna write me, <laughs> that's your dog, not my dog. <laughs> not my <Right>? dog. <laughs> <laughs> Who let I, the dogs out? Let's make that editable. Although I kind of like the dog. I kind of like the dog uh, too, good dog. absolutely. Um, I'll have him as a guest. A sound like a pretty, no worries. No worries. No worries. Keep it in. Oops. I just did something really bad. Here, hold on. My computer's doing a thing that it does every so often. I'm, I'm still sound there good. We go. Okay, we're okay now. Uh, not I can move closer, but I'm naturally going to move back, so you may need to interrupt and remind me every so often. Oh, wait, I know what I can do. Give me just a second. Give me a moment here. I need something to put something on. Um, there isn't anything in my house to put something on. How can the, ah. I see a Damages 3 book in the background. There is a Damages 3 book, and I'm going to do two things. And this is serendipitous here. I'm going to... Damages 3. And Shakespeare. And a Shakespeare. Perfect. And that will raise the mic. Now that might help. But if I come any closer to that, I'm going to need a, a breath deflector. And yeah, that helps. That helps a lot. Okay, good. In fair Verona. Okay. <clears throat> Leave you space, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry about that, but allergies are forever with us. Okay, thank you. And I have no, no, not a problem, but I have no idea what I was saying. <laughs> well, you were, you, Al, in broad strokes, you were talking about uh, you sort of your journey in, as, a, as a jury, I don't know if it's fair to say a jury consultant, litigation consultant, and you were talking about um, uh, you're you're two or three years in. You found that you developed this niche in damages. And the, and the question I wanted to ask you before you move on, David, is why damages? I mean, you could have focused strategy because on liability. You could have focused it on causation. Uh, why damages? Well, first there was a lot of there, there was insofar as strategy stuff was being taught, it was about liability. Mm -hmm. uh, causation was kind of neglected, mm -hmm. as it still is. Uh, although I think we're in a lot better shape with with people out there advising, and, and a lot of us have written about causation by now. Uh, but I was watching lawyers put on pretty damn good cases, and then 
because people would be uncomfortable asking for money. Uh, and so, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to come back around with money. Yeah, right. Kind of thing. And, and just no idea of the understandable discomfort with, with putting out an ask. And how do you deal with that? How do you make the jury comfortable with it, A? And B, how do you make the intangible tangible? Um, the pain and suffering. The pain and suffering, the, the other stuff that goes in that category. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you show that that money will do some good, mm -hmm. which on the long wending path eventually takes you to deterrence, which after all is half the purpose of tort law, mm -hmm. um, if not more, because that's, what, that's why we have trials. So... It was just an area of many that I thought people could be much better at. It is so easy to sit back and, and tell people how to do things better. And I think what I've loved about this business is, same as in theater, it is so easy to tell people a bit better ways to act, better ways to do a character. I find it difficult, if not impossible, to get up and do the damn things. Mm -hmm. I'm not good at that. I would have been in jail by now if I'd been a trial lawyer because, <laughs> for example, first of all, I can't keep track of two or three things at the same time as you need to do often in trial. Mm -hmm. And second, uh, I have no uh, social control. I mean, you can only tell a judge to go to hell so many times before you get <laughs> you know, tossed in the... Yeah, not too uh, many it's, times. It's, it's not a skill. I, I, I can't do my best in that situation. And I have infinite admiration for people who can do it, just like I had infinite admiration in theater for those actors who can get up and do a sensational job. So I'm constantly working with people doing something that I think it's amazing that anybody can do that. And you are amazing for being able to do it and for, for, for being willing to try to do it. Like theater, like acting, when you get up to do a case, it, it largely is about you. You're there in flesh and blood. You are constantly the basketball player with two seconds to go on the clock with two foul shots in a one-point game. Constantly. Mm -hmm. And the same with actors. It, it's, it is about you. If success is yours, the failure is yours. Not just yours, but that's what it has to feel like at that moment. And well, that... Yeah. I so admire that. So to answer your question, why about damages? If I could help people do that, everything else would flow. And in fact, if you look at even the first damages edition, an awful lot of it did get into liability mm -hmm. because so much of the liability case determines damages. Well, a couple of points I want to discuss with you because I, I don't know if it will be as um, self-evident to a lot of our listeners the connection between theater and trial work. I mean, you think of lawyers and you think of people buttoned up in suits and you think of evidence and proof and a lot of um, technical competence maybe, or <laughs> hopefully. Um, and, and this was new to me when your book came out, because I remember this, you, you, you probably don't remember, I'd be surprised if you did because you've given so many seminars and met so many people. But the first time I met you, you were kind of on the road with uh, the wonderful Josh Carton, mm -hmm. um, and there was a, a third person whose name escapes me. You would remember her as a, as a woman, actress, actor who was on, sort of on tour with y'all. But y'all were doing seminars, and I went to one of your seminars. And was oh, that probably that probably was Mary Ryan, who's a trial yeah. consultant, and well, I'm not, I'm not sure she'd been. An I feel actress like it was a name like Amanpour or, or well. Uh, uh, and Artemis Malikpour is my partner, partner and has yeah. been for 20 years, but she was never an actress. Well, this was a she was a law student at Duke because she's a lawyer, <laughs> yeah. actually. Well, this is a lovely woman, but y'all came and spent uh, two days um, sort of introducing uh, the trial lawyer group that I was involved with here in Atlanta uh, to theater. Um, but talk to us about, and, and my initial, and I was a theater guy coming along in high school. I've always loved, loved the theater and performance. But it wasn't readily evident to me the, the connection and the importance of understanding basic theater skills, movement, voice, um, 
you know, all the things that go into production, props, costume, uh, color, the role of color, the role of, um, you know, all the supporting cast. So talk to us about that connection between theater and understanding the principles of theater in being an effective trial advocate in a courtroom. Sure. It's, you've got to be careful here because theater means doing things that are fake. Well, so is trial an artifice. You're reproducing in trial something real. It's not real anymore by the time you get to trial. The suffering of your client might be, other than that, not much is real that relates to the event itself. So you are reproducing something, which is all the theater is. There are a lot of methods in theater that help you get at the truth of what you're trying to communicate. There's a lot that is about the artifice, and that's not the part we get into. But how is it that we can turn Hamlet or Rocky III into a real human being that people can react to in real ways? How can we take the very complex behavior of a character on the stage or on the screen and make it clear enough so that you can understand lots and lots and lots of things about that character over just a couple of hour period. How do, how do we do those things? Uh, how do we get a jury, simple things like, how do we get them to look here instead of there? You know, and uh, the nonsense that's thought about where to stand during cross-examination, which is blather. I mean, it makes no sense at all to any theater person. You don't, you, you, there are other more solid principles on how I can get the audience to look from me to you than going and standing behind the jury so they look at that person. <laughs> well, some of them are going to be looking around behind themselves to see what the hell you're doing behind them or over to the side. It's, so a, little, it's a little creepy, but that's what they teach in law school. You very know, stand creepy. at the end of the yes. jury box yes. and force the witness to... Yes. I mean, now, the, the motive may be right. You want their attention on that person. But there's better ways. To, it's that it's that sort of thing. Right. Um, it's how do you take the information that you're trying to convey and do that in a way that the jurors hear what you want them to get. It's as Eric Oliver points out, even in a book title, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Well, expand that. It's not what you do in trial. It's how you do it. That's 90% of the load between you and your case and each juror. And it's slightly different for each juror because every juror is at least a slightly different human being. Well, we have the same exact same problems in theater that you have in trial on every level. Um, we know in the theater that the quickest way to make a person look suspicious is what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. The way that at the time, almost every lawyer sat at counsel table listening. <laughs> so whenever the jury looked in your direction, as they do frequently while you're listening to see how you're reacting. And for our listeners who cannot see you, you've got your hand across your face and yes, hands under your chin. And, yeah. uh, or Somebody on a direct exam and you have to do a cross in a little while or your client on their cross says something and you know you need to deal with it. So you pick up a pencil and you scribble it down and you underline it three times and you circle it to make sure you don't forget to deal with it. Well, the whole jury's now seen you panic. Right. It's, it's, it's an endless array of things like that because you're not thinking in terms of how the jurors are perceiving, not just what they're seeing, but again, how they're seeing it. Little things. The way so many male attorneys would beckon their paralegal, their female paralegal, to come over to them. What I call giving them the finger. Mm -hmm. oh, that crook the finger, for those who can't see me. Not I'm, the middle finger, the crook not finger. Not the middle finger. Well, yes, but it's crooking your finger. That's a demeaning gesture. Yeah. And people on the jury who have had crummy bosses who do that kind of crap. They react to that sort of thing. So in one sense, what all we're doing is providing sensitivity training uh, <laughs> for lawyers to get out of the 
the, the glass jar of their case and the law and even the intellectual part of the strategy and into things that are being human. This is the part that Joshua Carton is so very gifted about. Mm -hmm. And... That may be you, David. It is. I thought I'd turn that off. Okay, I'm back. So start, start over again with talking about the part, start with the part about Josh Carton, because I want to make sure that's captured. Of the people I knew at the time, and even now, 30 years later, the person most gifted at that human part of it, who, who you are, who you are being, how you are coming across, the part of you that you're drawing on, Josh Carton, uh, Catherine James, a couple of other people who are superbly gifted at helping people in that realm. There are a few other people out there now who have learned from them and, and, and who are getting started uh, who will replace them because while they're younger than me, we are still the old, older generation doing it. All, all actors, you know, though, for people who are not familiar with these names, all at one time uh, professional, either in the theater or professional actors. I know Josh has a background, and of yes. course, Catherine, I think, is still working. She and her husband yes. are still yes, performing. And, uh, one of the battles I had early on when I started being a consultant was this a group called the American Society of Trial Consultants which always seemed to me mostly a marketing organization rather than anything else it wasn't intended to be, but the bigger firm sort of took it over. I stormed out at one point and that was the end of it uh, <laughs> because they would not, they didn't respect the people like Joshua and Catherine because they weren't psychologists or sociologists or, you know, people who were so divorced in the same way from the reality of the courtroom, the reality, the flesh and blood reality. So Joshua and others, very few others like him, were very good at helping you as an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could be helpful with that, but those were the really gifted ones. My area became more of how do I equally personalize and make clear the content of the case? Mm -hmm. How can I take who you're being? Um, Rick Friedman has re recently written a brilliant book called The Way of the Trial Lawyers, beyond, Trial Lawyer Beyond Technique, about what is your ethos? Who are you in there when you are putting on this case? Sounds fuzzy and, you know, new agey as hell. It's not. It's a very practical book mm -hmm. on, on, on how to be... Why won't my phone stop if I turned it off? Because you're a popular man. I'm sorry about that. I can't even figure out what's ringing. It sounds like your landline. It is, but it shouldn't be ringing. It's off. You mentioned uh, you mentioned Rick Friedman and, and his. Yeah, let me let me go back to that, and that'll be a good point to pick yeah. up to get it. <laughs> the beauty of podcasting, we can edit all that out. I don't know how to make all this stuff. You may, you may just um, undo the plug that goes into yeah, it. I know, that would help, but I, I have done that. That's why this is a mystery that it's ruined. Hold There's on one. just a second. I could also put it in a bucket of water. <laughs> you could do okay. yeah, that. That one's unplugged. I guess where I have the on-off switch does not take out the whole system the way I thought it did. Okay, I'm back. Please work. You were talking about uh, Rick Friedman, another yeah. wonderful the, trial lawyer out in, out in Washington State now. Along the lines of the work Joshua and Catherine and the others do about who you are is a particularly brilliant book that Trial Guides has put out for, but from Rick Friedman. And, of course, anything that says Rick Friedman on the cover you need to read. Um, but um, I feel the same way. This is a unique one. It's called the way of the trial. The way of the trial lawyer, beyond technique. It's not saying you don't need technique. It is saying beyond technique. Mm -hmm. And it's it's who you are. It's the ethos of the lawyer. Uh, if you're up there worrying about money or ego or anything like that, that's going to come out in how you do your work, which every actor knows, of course. 
You know, who you're being inside controls what we're going to see outside, no matter what you're trying to pretend otherwise. And my work, on the other hand, was much more involved in how do I strategize this thing? How do we take the, the stew of stuff that is the case and mix it all together uh, and shape it and frame it and evolve it so we end up with the optimum way for the jury to perceive it, the right context for everything, the right sequence for everything, so that you have jurors with you from the first words out of your mouth, so that you're not waiting, for example, for just one example, you don't wait for redirect to rehabilitate your witness from cross. You take care of those problems before cross. Why? Because you don't want the jurors thinking bad things about that testimony for even that short period of time. Mm -hmm. For a lot of reasons, it will affect things. And I think the greatest impact, insofar as I had any impact, was not just that, but because the Damages book sold really well, other publishers and the publishers of Damages started to see that you could actually make money selling Damages, selling strategy books because there were almost none out there. I was told when I sat down to write the theater tips book, don't write about strategy, nobody will publish it, which is sort of true. Now, because of the snowballing effect of all that, you look at the trial guide shelves and to a lesser extent some of the other publishers, you look at those shelves and there's an amazing amount of stuff out there. The irony is we're in a generation where people are reading less. So they're ignoring this incredible storehouse of great information. There's even a trial consultant out there who's telling her people, her, her audience, don't read any books, which is... That, uh, that does, not, does not resonate with me. I think reading yes. is essential. Well, people don't read much anyway anymore. A lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. And so when a new book comes out, it's, oh, one more book. And it's a bit frustrating to see that there's a younger generation of lawyers coming up who have this gift in front of them that you never had, mm -mm. that the older generation didn't have and, and sopped up like a sponge. And you can just look at the, the rise in verdict amounts over the years. That's coming out of those books. Uh, it didn't just happen by itself. It's not the CLEs. The CLEs don't have that breadth of audience. Well, and if I could just make, make this point too, David, because uh, you're not going to make it yourself, but your book on damages uh, was foundational for so many trial lawyers because they don't teach this in law school. They don't teach how to organize an opening statement. They don't teach the importance of language and, and resonance and, and the, uh, the, the different ways to talk about damages. And I remember your first iteration of the book was... I'm not going to say it was slim, but it was it was to the point. <laughs> we'll say to the point, and, but it was it was it was essential reading for every trial lawyer. I know everybody getting ready for a trial had your book on the table as they're working through their examinations, cross exams, whatever it was. And then you came out with the more robust damages three, and then the next. I don't know if this is absolutely the correct sequence, but then the, at least in my mind, the sort of the next uh, seismic event. Uh, from you to the trial community was the revolution on uh, reptile, the reptile revolution. Actually, and the two, reptile and damages three, were simultaneous. They were at the same time. Okay. Well, there are two, two earthquakes then of, uh, yeah. of, of uh, essential reading. Well, and right now, the only place to learn any reptile stuff is damages three because reptile is no longer in print. Right. And the book, but, I mean. But the, but the, the echo of it and the yes. effect of it is still very much... Evident mm -hmm. just for our audience, um, and I'll give a little bit of a story. Uh, you'll remember this event very well because it was it was a miserable weekend. But you were uh, speaking in Keystone, Colorado, uh, and it was a weekend event, and you were speaking on damages. Uh, and of course, I signed up with a close friend of mine, Render Freeman, and we went from sea level here in Atlanta to about eleven thousand feet <laughs> within eight hours or six hours. 
And, and there's no air. There's, there's no, no air. air. And, and everybody was suffering. We all had altitude sickness, headaches. Yeah. I mean, nobody was in a good mood because we were just miserable. And you soldiered through it. But I remember at the end of the seminar, you, uh, you made the comment. You said something's coming. You know, I've been, uh, you know, along with Don Keenan, we've been working on this project that we're going to introduce that will uh, help push back on the forces of tort reform and efforts to reduce uh, access to the courts and jury system and all those, those problems and uh, and it had an impact it hit hard and has been misconstrued and misquoted up and down left and right but the effect of it has been to it properly applied has been to make lawyers better and help us focus on where we should be focusing on the high activation components of our case um, as opposed to you know chasing every little rabbit um, and it's had a tremendous effect, and it scared the heck out of the defense. It uh, also actually has provided a lot of money for the defense because there's all these people running around teaching how to how to defeat the reptile. Defeat the reptile. None of them have come anywhere close to succeeding. Nobody's figured out how to do that yet, and they're not gonna. Uh, but there are a few people, including some good people. Um, a lot of it's nonsense. There's a nonsensical book out there called. Uh, 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 Nuclear verdicts, or something like that, which is which is one of those books where I say to the to the defense lawyers, please do what it says in that book, because you're walking right into our jaws when you do what that person is telling you to do. And in fact, my I know this isn't true, but my secret suspicion is that that book was written by a very clever plaintiff's attorney, trying to uh, entrap the defense into doing that stuff. Sort of three dimensional well, chess going on. Yes, bit. yes. <laughs> so they don't throw me in the briar patch if anybody still knows. Well, the, but the reptiles had a. We, we shorten it. We just say the reptile. Uh, tell the audience what that means. I know we it, have a number of public folks who don't aren't lawyers who may be listening. So tell us what that it means. Basic, it basically goes back to the initial purpose of tort law, which is to keep the place safe. By the place, I mean the community you live in, the society, the country that you live in, safe. Uh, originally, if somebody got injured, it was up to the king, if there was a king, to the crown to pay whatever it cost to feed that person in an institution someplace. And eventually the crown got fed up with that. So they started saying, well, okay, we're going to turn this over to the community so that the person who did the injury is now going to be in charge of the, is now going to be responsible for paying for the harm they do. Uh, and the purpose of that is going to be so that people stop being careless about how they treat each other, which is the source and still very much fundamental to the whole purpose of, of all tort law, well, tort law and, and everything that we all do. Uh, and so starting there, in other words, taking it right down to the basis of what the law is about, how do we get the jurors to see that a, we're trying to overcome tort reform with this thing, remember, where they'd been lied to for years by the insurance industries and the defense side and all the corporations, uh, that the best thing for them to do for their own benefit is to turn away all these plaintiffs. It was an enormous poisoning of the jury pool. So all the reptile did was try to bring them back and say, let's, let's go back to the purpose of this law. It is to keep you safe. If that trucking company is going to let its drivers do what this driver did, then when your kid goes to cross the street, he can get run down by a truck. Now, you can't say it quite that way in trial, but you can point out to the jurors why they need to be responsible for the harm they did is not just for the benefit of the people they harmed, but it's for the benefit of all society because if, if you make them pay the proper amount, and I'm not talking about punitive damages yet, just the compensation, not extra money, to compensate, just the true compensation, the full compensation, then the world will be safer because people like that will be forced economically to be safer. And if you don't do that, then the world will get more dangerous because Acme Trucking Company will now have less of a reason to train or supervise or hire carefully. And that's the heart of the reptile. That's really all it is. Mm -hmm. That with some good strategic sense applied to it. And the reason it works so well is because it, it fits into the law like a hand into a glove. 
That's what the law is for. That's why the irony that you'll always encounter a motion, don't let him use reptile stuff in trial. Well, that's why it's almost never a motion that passes. The defense almost never wins it unless the plaintiff's attorney has no idea how to fix it. And that advice is available on every listserv there is practically. If not, contact us. We'll send you some stuff. Um, but all, is, all it is is it says this system that happens in that courtroom is for your benefit. You're not here just sacrificing your life to be a juror for six weeks or six days or two days, whatever it is. You are here because the world you live in. Now, you need to say this in ways that pass legal muster. You can't violate the golden rule, and we never do. Uh, people fall into it and shouldn't, but you don't need to. But that's what the reptile is. It is making jurors see that this whole thing all the millions of dollars for the courthouse and the time for this and the trial is here for the benefit of the community. This is a community, a state, a, a thing that we are trying to maintain in decent shape. Um, well, it, it's interesting to me, David, that the concept of, of uh, a civil jury trial is alien to a lot of people until they show up and serve on a jury mm -hmm. and they understand the criminal side of things. They understand that if they're speeding down the highway or through a school zone and they get a ticket, you know, they're going to pay a lot of money. So there's an incentive to slow down, pay attention, because they don't right. want to pay out of money. That's so all we're doing. That's, that's all, all we're doing on the civil that. side, right? That's, that's all the reptile does. It's just that since it approached trials from a very different point of view, that it was so revolutionary that a lot of judges were nervous about it, which is why we spent a lot of time in the back quarter of the reptile book is, is uh, the golden rule actual law is state by state, which is not at all what people think it is. Um, and I got to explain quickly what golden rule golden is. Golden rule means you can't say to a jury, how would you feel if this happened to you? How much money would you want? Right. You can't do that. And there's good reason for that. But reptile doesn't do that. And if a lawyer does that while he's doing the reptile, then he's doing the reptile wrong. But we spend a lot of time helping lawyers see if, if the judge won't let you do it this way, try it that way, et cetera. Um, I've just finished doing a lot of the same thing, not reptilian, but in a different sense with the criminal defense book. Um, how, you go right back to the fundamental purpose of the law and you build your strategy on that. And then you frame it so that it fits procedure, it fits custom, it fits how you're allowed to do a case. And I think that's why this stuff works so incredibly well. I can't write from an experiential point of view. I don't do the trials. I sit at most of the, a lot of the trials. I see what happens. And yes, I can write experientially there, but I ain't on my feet doing it in front of a jury. It's not the same thing. So I had to go to a different source. And my source is a pretty rich one, which is why did they create this whole thing in the first place? Now let's fit what we're doing into it. It's like putting together a musical. Why did they invent musical comedies? It's to play songs and make comedy. That's mm -hmm. what it's for. Now let's do what we're going to do within that framework. This is the same thing. Well, you... And it's ultimately about human beings and about the lives they lead. And then came, and I don't want to forget this part, the turn of the 20th century, 21st century, then along comes neuro, the neurosciences, which by today have completely altered everything we've known, have completely opened the door to everything we know about how human beings make decisions. It's shown that almost all 20th century theorizing about psychology and the psychology of decision making was not just not quite on point, it was absolutely wrong. That's not what the brain is doing when we make decisions. It's very different. And since I had that science background, suddenly I was perfectly set up to move into that area. Uh, and I've done a lot of work with that area now. Uh, I'm very near Duke University where I used to teach theater. And uh, I've been working closely with some neuroscientists there. In fact, we're, there's a, I'm not working on it now, but it went on for a good while. A National Science Foundation grant studying how jurors make decisions that we spent a lot of time in the labs with. And there's so much more known from around the world on, on, on all of this. 
that when you put all that stuff together, it comes out. My primary contribution to it so far has been in a book called Damages Evolving, mm -hmm. which is the damages book I wrote with my partner Artemis Malikpour and Nick and Courtney Rowley, mm -hmm. a husband-wife trial team. That is to sort of trials the way uh, uh, any, any brilliant duet of anybody is to any field. Um, and my part of that book was, was largely grounded on what, what, I, what we had learned from the neurosciences, as is the criminal defense book. Well, so give us a, not, what have we learned, David? What, what are some of the insights? Well, for example, uh, we have learned that logic has very little to do with decision making, whereas law school still, and all of all advice on the matter up until then had strictly to do with logic. And emotion is not the other half of it. Mm -hmm. It's there's logic, there's emotion, but the way it's all put together and the way that the, it's, it's, it's a very different thing. Um, the enormous power of biases that we don't know we have so that, and how much those biases affect what you think is logical thinking. You can watch two very logical, very smart pundits on television arguing politics. They will both be absolutely logical and still not in agreement with each other. They will never notice, ever, ever convince each other that I'm right and the other one's wrong. They never change each other's minds. Well, you as a trial lawyer, you are in the business of making up other people's minds. It's an extremely hard thing to do, and now we know how to do it. It's not magic, it's not simple, it's not easy, it takes skills, but now we are much, much better at doing it than we were even five or ten years ago. So to these people, and there are people, who are telling the lawyers don't read books, don't read the books. I don't care. Let the people that I work for and with be the ones who start coming up with verdicts that panic the defense and let these other people go on slogging along with, with you know, uh, whatever it is they're slogging along with. But you can see the difference. I mean, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. But the decision-making process, there are some things that fire in the human brain that make a big difference. And those things are different from person to person, from case to case. How do you find out what they are? How do you find them in the materials of your case? That's largely what damage is evolving is about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, my part of it, uh, there's an equal amount of wisdom from the Rowleys and of course from Artemis, but we've come so darn far that when I see people, I'm not saying go read my book or you're doing something wrong, there's other ways you out are. there to learn that stuff. <laughs> you don't well, no, <laughs> no. Any trial lawyer who's not read Thinking Fast and Slow is not properly serving their clients. Yeah. Uh, any trial lawyer who doesn't know about the book Incognito would be a better trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, the resources are sitting right there. You don't even have to leave the house. Download them on Kindle. You're going to have a half hour. Ask me. I'll give you my favorite reading list. Mm -hmm. um, the resources are there. Um, so I, the patience that I used to have with people's varying levels of skill and natural gifts has slowly disappeared as these tools... You, you needn't be Jerry Spence to get Jerry Spence results now. Well, I, do you think that the rise of the screen and the TikTok and the Twitter slash X and that, and that instant sort of uh, little bundles of data that we're used to getting on our phones or iPads and all those things. Uh, it seems to me, at least, that that kind of is driving the impatience with the book. Um, and I, and I'm, I completely agree with you. We are in a a, a renaissance of, of education and resources available that were not there when uh, when I was coming along, you know, 20, yeah. 25 years ago. But the advantage, I mean, I'll just preach for two seconds. The advantage I see of sitting down. I don't like Amazon books as much. I read on Amazon, but I like to have a physical book when the tri and talking about trial books is that it makes you slow down 
And while you're reading, you can't help but have little pings in your brain about your this case or that case that reminds you of it. And you have a little pad there. And, and it can be very helpful to kind of mine nuggets and, and insights that you're just not going to get, you know, at least as easily with a screen. Uh, and you're certainly not going to get unless you do something to, to access these these resources. And, of course, we haven't even talked about there's so many trials uh, online now that you can actually watch real mm -hmm. trials, which is another incredible advantage that wasn't really there a long time ago or you know, 20 years ago. Well, to the people who don't read, to the people who don't practice what they're going to go out and practice, think of it as sports. You're not engaged in an intellectual process. You are engaged in a process of learning how to do something, mm -hmm. not how to act like you're doing it, mm -hmm. which is what some people are teaching, but how to do it, which means you need to know the concepts, which you won't get much of at seminars except with some very... Seminars are great. I do a ton of them. Mm -hmm. And you should go to all those that you can. We've got so many great free ones now, much less... Mm -hmm. Some that you have to pay for, but the free ones in many cases are better than the ones you have to pay for. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. There's this enormous amount of stuff in books, and books obviously contain a lot more than any seminar. What I tell people is, before you prepare for any trial, <coughs> me, before you prepare for any trial, sit down at your desk, close your door, tell people not to bother you for the day, and page through every one of your favorite books. There should be five or six or seven of them. Mm -hmm. And notes from seminars. Just just page through them, and you'll spot stuff. Oh, this is what I need for this case. I'd never noticed that before because I wasn't doing this case. Don't waste all that stuff. There's this enormous... Well, people who think they can rely on their natural gifts and some tricks... There may be some geniuses like that. I'm sure there have been. I can't name any of them. You, there's a phenomenon, a phenomenon that happens. I don't mean that in the amazing sense. It's just a natural occurrence. Mm -hmm. Lawyers who've done really, really well early in their career then level off. Mm -hmm. They stop getting better somewhere in their late 40s, early 50s. And then there are the lawyers who that's the period of their greatest learning. And there are lawyers who don't do that, who will simply turn around and hire Artemis or hire me or hire, hire any of, there might be another 15, 20 really good consultants in the country, uh, maybe more these days, I don't know, um, to do that for them. But it's not the same thing as you also having it. Mm -hmm. But you know, is it easier? Is it are there people you know were used to the quick sound bites? What if Michael Jordan had been that way? Right. What if you know these are people that you are doing? It's not an intel. Yeah, the law school is the intellectual part, but that's in your past. Uh, David, talk to us about where we are today. Um, there's been a lot of discussion uh, that verdicts are getting bigger, uh, that juries seem more activated, I and mean, that's that's been my personal observation, um, uh, keeping in touch with lawyers around the country, that there do, se there do seem to be more significant verdicts on a more consistent mm -hmm. basis. Um, tell me your thoughts about where we are today, what's going on in the sort of the gestalt of, a, of well, America. The, the biggest thing I have to say about the gestalt is, is don't gauge tomorrow, and I literally mean tomorrow, by what it's like today. Mm -hmm. Things are moving too quickly. We live in an incredibly divided culture, probably one of the most divided cultures you can have that's not violent. Um, and it, the things that are important to it change like that. And those things have enormous consequences on your jurors. And we happen to be in a period right now where there's a lot of hostility toward power, the power that be, whoever that power is. Mm -hmm. And that could be corporations, it could be the government. Well, obviously, that's going to favor us. Mm -hmm. That can turn around and go the other way. It took us a few years to undo the ravages of tort reform. But now you can go, think of the world pre-Floyd, 
the fell in Minneapolis with a knee on his neck. Mm -hmm. The pre-Floyd to the world the week after. It was a totally different country. Mm -hmm. Jurors had totally different things on their minds and not just civil rights. It changes rapidly. And we're coming into one. That's why we called the book Damages Evolving. Mm -hmm. It's not just about how to do damages now. It's about how you adapt as time goes forward, what you look to. And here are some things that won't change as time goes on. Here are some things that will. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, the where we are now is in a period of enormous flux. Um, we are in a period where people feel simultaneously empowered and helpless. I know that doesn't mean anything if you think about it for a minute, but it's true. I don't have to put up with the crap anymore, they'll cry while they're putting up with the crap. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's what's going on in their heads, that's a great power for us to harness if you know how, mm -hmm. which is a large part of the work that I've been doing. How do you get there? There are some timeless things. There are characteristics a person can learn that brings them step by step closer to the kind of human being we say has charisma. Donald Trump, Adolf Hitler, Bill Clinton, Jesus Christ, these were people with a personal charisma. Mm -hmm. It can be for good or for evil, but it is a magnetism. Of, well, probably if I do another book, that's what it's going to be about, about how you can, you will never have the charisma of the people who have maximum charisma, but you can have enough to make a huge difference in how you practice. That transcends. The reptilian thing of protecting myself and my family transcends. So I don't care what period we're in, those things will work. So that's what I'm looking for. In other words, I'm saying we live in a configuration of enormous complexity, of huge division, where you can lose a case as a plaintiff's attorney just by asking about politics in voir dire because you set up battles among the jurors. And I will never agree with that damn juror who thinks X is a great man. I'll never, no way, I, I, don't, I don't want to sit in the same room with him. And that's very live right now and about to get liver. Um, how do you navigate those waters? So where are we? We're in a period of incredible flux. Hmm. Anybody who describes where we are right now is ignoring the fact that by the time anybody's listening to what they've said, things can have changed mightily. So that's how I'm seeing it. And at age 81, that is a weird thing to say. Wait, repeat that last one. What's, at what's my weird? Eight, at oh, my your age. age. At my age of 81, <laughs> one would have helped the world. One would have hoped. I was in the Peace Corps. I should have had the world settle down by now. Everything should have been calm. <laughs> and I totally failed because where was I in the Peace Corps? In Afghanistan. Great. Uh, the, yeah, how did that work is, out, David? You should yeah, have stayed and, <laughs> until your work was done. I maintained that I, my individual, I kept the place safe for about five, six years. And yeah. then it all blew up. One person, what do you expect? Yeah, it's a no, country, seriously, it's a though, it, it's a very scary world from a number of players. So there's nothing unusual that it's scary for lawyers. So how do we take advantage of, it's like the energy development, how do we take advantage of all that chaotic energy in nature to turn it into something that will run your television set? How do we take advantage of all the energy of that chaos of our society today and turn it into something that will help me make up that juror's mind the way I need that juror's mind made up to be? That's both how I see the world and how I see the job of the consultant right now. Uh, you said something that resonated. You, you mentioned discussing politics during jury selection, and, and by custom, it seems like that's a kind of the third rail. You just don't do it. I'm not aware of any rule that says you can't ask how many Democrats, how many Republicans, independents. Um, and I've seen in a recent trial, you can, you, know, you can do it, and sometimes you, can, you have to. You can, you, you, right? At least in Georgia, I'm speaking about, about mostly Georgia. That's where I usually practice. Um, it's just a custom not really done. Now, what I'm seeing more of is defense lawyers asking kind of uh, proxy questions. You know, where do you get your news from? Um, it's kind of a proxy question. And um, what I noticed about the question, though, is it, set, it did set up tension in the room because you, know, you could see people didn't want to say that they 
listen to you know NPR or Fox News or because mm -hmm. they understand where the questions coming from. They don't trust the questioner. It's like okay, mm -hmm. what are you? You know, is this a Salem witch trial? I mean, what are you? Are you trying to yeah. smoke me out of my politics? Yeah. And uh, but also comment about that. Well, there's the oldest myth in the world is you can't do well in cases in that venue because it's very conservative. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that that's nonsense. Conservative jurors, if you do your case well, if you know where those people are coming from, they're actually better jurors than liberals tend to be. Mm -hmm. But you've got to know the values that have made those people conservative. The, the question about where you get your news from goes back to before I ever got involved in this business. It was there a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Starting the civil rights movement. And that's the reason it, it, it came in then. Um, and it, it's an okay question, but that's also what questionnaires are for. You can learn things about jurors now online. You want to learn more about jurors in addition to what you do in live voir dire? Uh, get some people to do some research online. There's some companies that will do it for you, even at the last minute. Mm -hmm. Get your jury list at 9 o'clock. They'll have information for you by 10. Um, you can learn a lot about jurors that way. Just make sure that you're doing the right thing with that information. Don't do the knee jerk. Thing. That person's a conservative and they like Trump, get rid of them. That person's a liberal and they love so and so, keep them. Well, you just may have made the flip wrong decision. It's like any demographic conclusion. I mean, this, we, there are people who used to teach, and there still are some, unfortunately. You want Jews in this kind of a case, you want Italians in that kind of case, Mexicans here, and, and they do all this. Well. Who in the world disagrees with each other more than people within the same group? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And you, you mentioned something, too, that I thought was interesting, uh, that the language of trial and the language to jurors is about values. And no matter where people are on the political spectrum, there are core values that just transcend politics. I mean, you better know what they are. And you better know what they are. People There's care about their children. People care about uh, how elderly people are treated in a, in a, in a nursing home. They care yeah. about how doctors should treat their patients. And but what a, we've learned is it goes political. deeper than that. It, it does go deeper than that. Mm -hmm. It's in, in the Damage is Evolving book, there's a list of things that I call flashpoints. Mm -hmm. These are things that we have a gut visceral response to. Let me give you one example because it's overwhelmingly important. The concept of respect or disrespect, humiliation, that, that area is incredibly important because we evolved in a world where those, that was a life and death issue. If you lost your respect, Back in the day when we were in tribes, you were dead. You got banished from the tribe, you would die. There's no question. So it was a matter of life and death for people, for, for others to respect you. If they disrespected you, it was like now today holding a gun at somebody with their finger poised over the trigger. Mm -hmm. So we are evolved so that we have powerful, powerful visceral responses, not just to being disrespected ourselves, but to seeing someone for whom we have some regard being disrespected. We hate seeing other people disrespected who, who, are, who are strangers. It's just one example of these flashpoints. You'll stand in line to buy tickets to something, and there's this line next to you going to the other ticket window, and you'll see some jerk come along and cut in line, and you'll get mad at that jerk even though it's not your line, and even though all that jerk does is slow things down for maybe 20 seconds but you want to kill the bastard. Well, <laughs> that is a flashpoint. Now, how much of the injury, injuries of your trial can you relate to that world of disrespect? Well, first, every act of negligence is an act of disrespect, mm -hmm. and you can frame it that way. Injuries, people feel dis disrespect flows out of that. You're suddenly imprisoned in a hospital Humiliating things are done to you, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, if you explore your case for just that one quality, you got something a lot more powerful than physical pain to drive your damages verdict with. Mm -hmm. Now you expand that by 10, 15, 20 things, not all of which are available in every case, but this is one of the things we learn from the neurosciences. 
Why? Because those things are attached to implicit biases that you don't even know you have that really light fires in you. Mm -hmm. The values are part of that, but only one small part of it. Mm -hmm. But the disrespect, disrespecting somebody in the wrong quarters will get you killed. Mm -hmm. A late night bar or as a prison inmate or a bunch of other arenas, um, it's the basis of road rage. You know, you disrespect somebody on the highway, you'd better be very careful these days because the, 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 the leashes are off. <laughs> uh, and it, because we hate it so much, when we see that that's what the defense defendant has done to your client, intentionally or not, it left them disrespected or feeling disrespected or humiliated or whatever. And aren't those the childhood memories that stick with us the longest? I mean, you can forget all the birthdays and the happy moments, but there's, sure. or at least not remember them as vividly. But boy, you'll remember that that school grind, that playground incident where everybody turned and laughed at you for something and pushed you off the playground. I mean, and I think part of the what you're the point you're making, which is so powerful, and I think Jerry Spence uh, really emphasized this, is is to elicit those stories from the jurors during jury selection where they remember these memories and, and, uh, and these experiences that help them relate to your client. So instead of just feeling bad that they're being dis that this client was not treated respectfully, they remember the incidents in their lives where they experience those same feelings. Can you talk I, about I, that a little I, bit? I have a little bit of a mixed feeling about eliciting those stories during jury selection mm -hmm. because you then have exposed that juror to being stricken. Um, although I think you still need to do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But more important is for you to come up with analogies over the course of trial that will elicit those memories in the juror. Without you know? publicly Th expressing this is them. Like, this is like as an analogy in closing or mm -hmm. getting, a, getting their client to talk about it. It's like if somebody's got a dangerous dog that's bitten somebody four times and now they let him out and you're running down the street with this damn dog behind you. Mm -hmm. You, you, and, and you get people thinking about their, everybody has those stories. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a matter of selection. Everyone in the world has those stories. And everybody's been humiliated, uh, either by the in-group of kids at school or the, you know, whatever it was. And if you think in those terms, everybody can relate on a very visceral level to your case. You just need to know what those channels are and how to get the jury there. And that's where the neurosciences have been so much help because, for example, they've shown us how do the, how do the implicit biases work? Mm -hmm. Because those implicit biases are one root. How do these flashpoints work? What are they? And once you know some, you'll realize others on your own. The, the riches are there. I don't mean the riches of your verdict, but the, the riches of ways to get to your client. Uh, and some of it is just very simple, <clears throat> a matter of how, does, how the brain works. D don't do the hard part of your liability case first. Do the part that's easiest to prove. Because mm -hmm. once the jurors think you're right about that, they'll be more easily able to think you're right about the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Don't flip that. Don't do your warts in the case before you show us what they did wrong. Those things are in one sense common sense but if you go watch how many lawyers do their cases it's not common sense at all because they come up with all all sorts of things that are hurting their case as they start well david we have been going a while before we finish up i want to uh i want to hear where it's kind of what's next for you you've been you've been in the trenches for for a number of decades you mentioned you're in your eighth decade of uh of being with us. Uh, what's next? What comes next? Well, the criminal defense book I just wrote took an enormous amount of time and energy because criminal stuff, I, I do a lot of criminal stuff, but it's so much more intricate when it comes to law in terms of constitutional rights and variance among states. And, and what I was writing about, the method that I've developed, is so counter to the way people have almost everyone has done their cases that it really took an enormous amount of time and energy to write mm -hmm. the book. And I just finished it a few weeks ago. So I'm still in the recuperation state. So right now I'm saying, if I ever write another book. Um, but I'm very interested in this, this thing called charisma uh -huh. and related concepts like 
The technique, I don't think I have major contributions to make to the technique anymore. Uh, I might have some ideas, but uh, and certainly on each individual case I work on, but not a book's worth of that. But this is the technique of how to develop more in, along the lines of, of how the jurors view, how they respond to you. What makes people want to follow someone else's lead? And how do we do that in a way that we can get 9 to 12 jurors doing that, using the materials of a case? What do you have to do? And we touch on that a little bit in Reptile, but I'd like to expand that. Uh, I'm very interested in in the work in, in my criminal work because as bad as tort reform was around the turn of the century, the criminal justice system is a hundred times worse mm -hmm. when it comes to the way individual citizens are treated, especially minority um, mm -hmm. and disadvantaged and poor are treated by the system. Uh, it's It's... The system in the abstract is a beautiful thing. The system in practice is probably the most corrupt thing in America. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that. There are many corrupt things in America. Uh, but it's, it's, it's desperately corrupt. I mean, why do we have all these people in prison? It's not because we have a whole bunch of bad people. It really mm -hmm. is not. So those are fairly high-level passion things for me. I continue to work on cases. My partner Artemis does almost all of our cases now, and I'll come in, you know, on a very complex case or <coughs> if it's something I'm really interested in or something like that. Um, but Artemis has the gift of not needing me, has not for quite some time. Um, she would say she's learned a lot from you, and I would. I just think put, she has. I, yeah. I think she has. But now we're at the point where I'm learning a lot from her. <laughs> well, um, I'll just say real quickly about Artemis. She contributed to a recent verdict that my close friend Laura Champ and I uh, achieved, and uh, spent three days in in focus groups with Artemis, and she gave us a number of great insights and gave us confidence that we were on the right track on mm -hmm. some very important um, decisions we had to make and. I just can't say enough good things about her. She's she's yeah, wonderful. She's, I, would, she, she, I can she see why she's fine. Like, yeah. She was a major find that turned out better than I My rule is if you're going to work with anybody, they have to be better than you and smarter That's than you. A, I follow but that rule too. <laughs> yeah, That's a great you, rule. You have to, or why yeah. have another person just take exactly. less work? It's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, th there's... I'm finding myself going back to do some Zoom teaching on theater, which is I haven't done in 30 years. Um, and I'm doing around with another great American novel or maybe a play or something like that. But this this work is my real passion. Is the, and it's not just for the altruistic thing of I'm trying to help humanity. Um, there's a great sense of, of satisfaction in developing things that other people can pick up and use and do better than I could ever do myself. And that, that remains who and what I am. Well, David, it's been such a pleasure having you here. I started off this podcast talking about what an impact you've had on my practice. Um, I know you have had a huge impact on so many lawyers, which translates into an impact on so many people who are injured and suffering and who would not have had the future and the, and the uh, achievement and trial without your contributions. I'm so grateful to know you and to have learned from you, and, and I'm very grateful that you came and spent some time with me on a uh, busy Tuesday to, to share some of your story with us. So thank you well, very you're much. Very, you're very kind to say all those things, and, and uh, uh, I'm not sure they're all deserved, but I'm sure some of them are. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, David. Thanks for doing this, Lloyd. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Take care.